Joe's Inner Child Podcast. First of all, I want to ask, did all of your work on Falcon and the Winter Soldier, was that all of that done in post or were you, you know, there for other parts of the, um, you know, project when they did the filming and those things so that you could do your part afterwards? It was all in post, sadly. I would have loved to have been there. Um, It was shot, uh, well, a lot of it was shot before the pandemic. and it was interrupted by the pandemic. But yes, no, I didn't. I didn't get to be the one shot. I would like to have been, but uh, alas. <laughs> now, so you did. I know that a lot of the stuff that you guys or that you focused on was in uh, the first episode, in the first, you know, really epic fight. And yeah. since it's been out so long, I feel like we can we can really dive into that. And I'm excited to to ask you a bit about it. Um, I know that you had done um, some stuff with Infinity War, so I wasn't sure if you used plates or templates from them uh, for the new Falcon uh, stuff, or was this completely from the ground up? We started with that for sure. We looked at it. Um, we had, uh, well, we had Anthony Mackie, right? We had Falcon as a scan, and we had the uh, wings that Falcon had at that time. But uh, this was a new design. Um, he had entirely new wings and a new costume. Um, there were comparisons made for sure. We did look at look at what we had already, um, but no, it was started again, and it started from uh, designs from Marvel's character design team. So we we received artwork, and that's what we had to make them look like. Um, so we rebuilt the wings from scratch. So when you had built those wings and you were and you were working on like them coming in and out and the, the motion of them, mm. um, what was like the greatest challenge there of making it look realistic? Um, yeah, it was. There were complications for sure. I mean, it um, they don't fit, do they? They're not going to fit inside that backpack. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so there's a sort of um, there's a bit of a cheat going on there, but uh, no, we had they're, they're very articulated. Uh, they have a much more um, bird-like style in their their form and design, um, and they have those little very thin plates with the sort of um, all these articulated sort of parts with hinges and joints all over, um, in, you know, in the dark bits, the black metal sections. Um, it's yeah they're they're quite complicated how they move and getting the the language of that working was probably the hardest thing about the wings I would say you know how how bird-like are they you know they weren't at all previously in in his previous wings they were like very solid looking chunky metal plates Um, and the new ones are more bird-like but you know they can flex but how much should they flex and you know, when do you get to, you know, because you don't want to get flappy birds, do you? That's not right. <laughs> um, you know, so they look more bird-like, but should he fly in any more bird-like of a way or not? And um, how much twist and flex is there? And there was a lot of talk around that. Um, and what these materials really are that they're made out of, how should they work? And, um, you know, there's a, there's a combination of, um, the notes can be, uh, you know, they can go to different, areas of the work you know it could be the look of the materials and the, what you believe it's made out of when you look at it and then there's the way that it performs in motion and there's like animation notes and, and the things all they all sort of play together to get the right look all these things need to be adjusted you know yeah definitely and with the the shield wings that's really something that you guys did from the ground up i think uh you guys had you guys had art that that kind of inspired how to do them. Um, And I know that we've talked about like the similarities to birds and whatnot, but Mm. for like the specific, um, you know, specific beats where the wings are, are being used as, you know, as, as a defense, you know, as the shield. um, How did you go about uh, the transition from wings to shield was that something difficult for you to to make seamless? Um, it was, yeah, it was. It was not possible really to rig the wings to do that. Um, so it's not like one set of wings that can do all these things. Um, yeah, that was going to be 
just not possible. So we kind of, um, it was really just done by hand, honestly, in animation, taking pieces of the wing geometry and in models, models took the wings that we had and would kind of um, deform them and uh, break bits apart and try to create those shield-like shapes. Um, it was a very tricky exercise. You know, you can't have the wings bent in half. They shouldn't look like they should be able to do that. Um, but they need to be able to do this performance and act like, um, you know, sort of bulletproof shields. Um, so yeah, again, it was models and animation between them. The wings weren't specifically rigged, even though I think it looks like they are. Um, you know, it looks like it's supposed to be able to do that, but we didn't make our model um, able to do that in any context. You know, it's really a per shot thing uh, done by hand, quite painstaking really. Um, and I think the way we get away with it is that it's done fast, right? The transition between, say, if they're folded, like backpack to full shield is pretty quick, right? So it's kind of, you know, he just puts his arms up and the thing's there. It's, it's really fast. If we had to do it slowly, um, which of course wouldn't make sense if you're defending yourself from gunshots. Um, but if we had to do it slowly, you'd see that there are various things not working probably quite how you imagine they should be. Um, it's just because it's fast that it, it works really well. That's that's pretty cool, especially when you put it that way. Um, yeah, each piece is animated by hand, basically. Resculpted and modeled, and then that new model is animated by hand to make it work. Yeah. Wow. So the was the beginning scene the very first thing that you worked on? I know that you had done a few other things and you had touched on stuff at the end, but yeah uh, did you start chronologically with this big opening scene as your as your first and main uh, point of focus absolutely we did and in fact that was the only thing we were going to do that's what we uh that's the work that we were expecting um, and that we initially bid on and that's for us that was what we were doing and we spent a good long time on that um and it was only when we had bandwidth to take on more later on that we did uh work on later episodes um, uh, which you know the first one has to come out first of course and we were working on the very beginning of the first episode so that was uh, scheduled to be delivered before everything else so we were going to have our crew and have time to do more more on a later episode so we picked up some stuff on the end yeah. we we had a lot more actually we started with 150 and we did at least 100 more shots oh, wow yeah. that's amazing so yeah. then were you doing those did you have to change any of the scenes you did? I know that they reshot things, but as far as you in in your post-production process or like in post from filming, did you have to change anything specifically using CG effects for um, the plot changes? We did. We, uh, we started with some previs that we were sent uh, for the canyon chase sequence. And... Um, you know, we started with that. That was made by someone else and delivered to us. And we used that for bidding and getting getting underway and creating shots. And you know, thinking about the process that we would processes we'd use to make those shots. And then, as we got into it, it became um, <clears throat> it became obvious to all of us really and and to the client that the parts of the story didn't quite work. You know, it wasn't it wasn't finished basically. The previous wasn't finished. It wasn't fleshed out enough. Um, and it, I think the main thing was that uh, it didn't seem like it kind of made sense that Falcon could struggle to catch the wingsuiters. Um, it didn't look like there was enough in his way, making it hard for him. Um, and that's when we introduced the helicopters, uh, sort of helicopter gunships shooting at him. And he, he veers off, you know, you see as he comes out of that narrow canyon and we, and we um, it opens up a bit and we see the helicopters for the first time. He veers off in one direction to try to escape from them and the wingsuiters go the other way. Um, this is, you know, a deliberate thing to try to give the wingsuiters time to get ahead and to hold him up. Uh, so we introduced that and, um, then there's a, a beat where he they fly through a very, very narrow slot and that doesn't work for his big wide wings. And he nearly gets caught and his wings scrape on the wall. It's another moment where it looks like it's going pretty bad for him um, and it allows them to get away a bit. And these were all ideas to try to uh, lengthen out the chase. You know? And of course, him being shot at by all missiles from the helicopters and... You know, just when you think it's under control, there's another helicopter which is armed to the teeth, 
uh, like an attack helicopter and starts shooting at him. Um, yeah, so those were all ideas that we introduced later. They weren't part of the original plan. I love that because that is, I mean, those things definitely help make the scene uh, mm -hmm. feel more complete too. So the canyon itself, like the canyon environment is entirely CG, right? That's right. Yeah. Can you, can you explain to me like the, how do you want to work about that process? Did you use shots that they gave you of what they wanted the canyon to look like? Or did you study any specific canyons like um, actual land formations to kind of inspire how you brought that to life. Sure, yeah. It, well, it is based on a real canyon. It's made from height maps, like satellite data from um, Pariah Canyon, which is Utah, Arizona. Um, and the surrounds all around it are height maps of uh, Libyan desert because the scene, you know, the scene was supposed to take place there. Um, the Pariah Canyon was perfect for us because it kind of starts very, very narrow and ends up wide. And that gives a really nice um, staging for our sequence. You know, they fly into the narrow slot at the beginning and, and towards the end it widens out into the wider desert uh, where you see Torres at the end with his Jeep and Falcon landing. Um, so we started with that height map and uh, we, you know, we make a model from that and that gives us a not simple terrain. It's very big um, in, you know, in world units, it's a pretty huge thing, but it's not, it doesn't really have enough detail. But this is a good, uh, a good place to start because it's natural and organic and, um, and you know, a real, a real canyon. If you tried to kind of make that from scratch as a model without really looking at real, um, real world data, it'd be very hard to make it look uh, supernatural in terms of the flow and, and the shape of it. Um, so we'd use that and we'd stage all our animation and our shots in that canyon in, a, you know, in this low res model. And then once we're happy with the way a shot's looking in terms of what the camera's seeing, um, we would then detail out that section of the low res model using uh, much more high res geometry. And we had these kind of rocky pieces like sections um, columns, chunks, um, and those would all be kind of inserted into the low res model to create all that extra geometric detail. Um, and this, so, so really the canyon was all CG, but it never really, ex it never existed as a whole. It was always um, very detailed right where the camera's looking. So each shot had basically its own model of a canyon. That's, that's really cool when you think about you know, being able to look at it from that way and all those different angles definitely mm. has to help you guys be able to see the full picture. I yeah. wanted to focus on Red Wing for a moment. Um, yeah. I know Red Wing was present in previous films, but there was definitely an updated model here. And I know you guys added a weapons carousel design. Mm. Tell me about the Red Wing process and, you know, you guys um, adding on or building up um, that from the ground up? Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, he's, you know, very much his own character, um, important feature in the story, and he's kind of Falcon's sidekick. Um, we started with uh, the model of his backpack because the backpack is a, a costume piece, right? So we that already existed out there in the world. He'd already been shot wearing the backpack. We got scans of the backpack. Um, and Red Wing, because he kind of slots onto it, you can obviously see him. He's part, he's part of the backpack before he disengages. Um, so there wasn't too much to figure out really, at least with the, how he looks on the top. Um, it was all about uh, how his wings swing out to give him that extra, you know, his swing wings when he, when he um, undocks from the backpack, we had to figure that out. Um, but yes, it was all about the underside. We had to do a lot of work on what he looks like from underneath. And uh, yes, we developed that weapons carousel that you mentioned, um, which is a really fun idea. It's, uh, it has, it basically has, it can have an infinite number of different weapons. Every time the, the sort of Bombay doors open to get the weapon carousel out, it's showing you the, the last, uh, well, in position is the last weapon that it used in the sequence. Um, and then it rotates 
and reveals a new one. And, uh, you know, that could happen forever. <laughs> it looks like it's a three-sided piece, you know, that could only have three weapons on, but it's really more like a, a loading mechanism. And inside of Red Wing, there can be any number of different weapons. Uh, and that was very uh, a very clever idea from someone in our models department. And um, it, it meant that, of course, we, we could put anything we wanted. And in the future, Red Wing can do anything he needs to be able to do because he can open up that Bombay doors and reveal whatever the new thing. <laughs> yeah. I loved it. I loved it. I loved Red Wing's presence in the beginning. Um, mm. And you guys, I, I don't really know how the process of face replacing goes, but I understand that there were a number of stunt doubles that you guys did face replacements for um, that played the Falcon in that scene. Can you kind of explain uh, to me the process of that, how you guys go about doing that? Yeah, well, Wes is pretty good at that. You got to say, you got to agree. We're pretty good at that. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not as hard as it might be, um, as it certainly as it used to be. I think we've had, you know, we've made giant strides in uh, rendering human faces over the last um, several years. And uh, it was just really not a big deal. We had a digi double already of, uh, Falcon because he's flying you know so we've got an all CG version of him um, we uh, we have to match move the character performing the stunt inside the plane for example you know when they're fighting um, so we get the head in the right position and then we you know light our CG character to look as much like what's in the plate as we can and we render it and honestly um I wish I could say it was way more detailed of a process and more difficult than that, but I think it just comes down to how good the, the facial motion is that our animators have created and how good the, the shading is from LookDev. These things just work so well. Um, and you know, when it's nicely lit by a lighter and rendered, all those things come together and you, you comp the head on in place of the other one. And, and you do sort of, um, blend it in a little bit, you know, it might be uh, the final result. It's not literally a head replacement. It might be partly partly the one guy, partly the CG guy. Um, but honestly, those shots gave us no trouble. And in fact, the first one that we sent, uh, nobody noticed that we'd done it. <laughs> you know, they actually didn't. I mean, the shot got final because it had other things going on. It had wings, it had fighting and, you know, bullets flying. and. Um, the shot got approved before anybody kind of picked that the head had been done. I mean, the, the head was in the brief. It was part of, uh, part of what they wanted done. It was in the sort of spec, if you like, their requirements. It's just that uh, it didn't draw attention to itself. So we just did it and, and we finished the shot. Um, so that was a, a, we saw that as a vote of confidence, you know, in the, the quality of that work. Yeah, no, it looks great. And with the... Um... The planes, you had mentioned adding helicopters in, and yeah. that, that was something that you guys added in yourselves. Did you um, have to study that specific model of, of helicopter plane so that you could make sure that it was rendered correctly? Because you, I'm assuming those helicopters were also fully CG, right? They were... Um... They were fully CG, yeah, so we built them. And uh, to answer your question, yes, did we study them? They're exactly, you know, they are, they're exactly an NH90, um, down to all the little bits that you see sticking out on the side. Um, yeah, they're pretty accurate models. Um, the often times where you see live action characters, say the camera's fairly near the helicopter and you've got the live action characters sort of sitting or fighting or whatever inside the helicopter, that was shot on a, a buck, which is like a helicopter interior on a blue screen. Um, and uh, we would line up our CG helicopter to that. So all the parts of the helicopter that's outside that you're looking at is CG and the inside part is the actors uh, inside the, the buck. That's really cool. Now, yeah. I, I want to make sure we touch on the wingsuits a little bit, uh, like yeah. the skydiving. Um, can you, you know, tell me about how different that was for you uh, compared to building Falcon? Because they're going to be going at different speeds. How did you kind of uh, work those in together to make sure that it, it seemed realistic um, 
it, while also giving them their own feel different to Falcon and Red Wing. Yeah, well, we, um, firstly, it was amazing that they shot it, right? That they shot live action wing seaters and gay, uh, stunt, you know, doing stunts, jumping out of planes, uh, Captain Vassant strapped to the back of a wing seater. I've never seen that done before. And that was a stunt. Um, and, uh, you know, there's no better reference than live action material in your own sequence. You know? So the fact that they shot some of that stuff and gave it to us was, was incredible, really. And um, we had to make the best of those shots, obviously, make them look the best they can. Um, <clears throat> but it gave us great reference for the, the CG wing suiters that we had to make to take over from them in, in wider shots. Um, with regards to the speed, we made we settled on a speed of about 350 kilometers an hour because that's kind of what Wikipedia says that NH-90 helicopters do. Um, and, you know, for animation, it helps to understand, you know, to have a sort of target speed for everything. Um, so that's loosely what we kind of, because we didn't really, you know, we don't know how fast a Falcon really flies, do we? Um, we could we could figure out how fast the wingsuiters go, but, you know, we went with the helicopter speed just to kind of get everyone moving at about a similar speed. It made sense, or, you know, a consistent speed. Um, but yes, the wingsuit modeling, I mean, and, and design was really uh, driven by the plates, how they perform in the plates, how they move, how the cameras move around them um, and what they look like. It was all driven by the, the material that we had in the scene already. Was there anything that you built and created um, CG wise that didn't end up making it into the sequence, just based on the length and everything that's going on? Um, on this occasion, no. We built, everything we built, we used. Um, someone's probably gonna correct me on that, but no. I really think every, everything we built, we did use. And we, uh, we even built some things as we went along. Um, normally, you know, we try to get all assets ready up front. Um, there are some shots inside the C-130 when, you know, when there are sort of instrument panel shots where you see the plane go into a dive and the panels sort of, uh, the instruments spin around. And, um, and we had, we didn't have anything for those, right? They were just kind of indicated by a kind of card uh, picture in the previs. And um, we were sort of expecting something to turn up at some point and uh, nothing eventuated. So we just made those, all of those instruments in CG. And then it was kind of interesting, found ourselves trying to work out how analog aircraft instruments work, which is probably not a problem if you're really a pilot, but um, we had to research how they work to make the needles animate in a you know, plausible way. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it speaks to how adaptable some of the team are to be able to just make that out of nothing, just like that. You know, I think Eric Levin, the client side supervisor, he, he really loved those shots. Yeah. Couldn't quite believe that we made them from scratch. Yeah, they look amazing. When I found out the canyon alone was built entirely in CG, it blew my mind. I had no idea. Um, you had mentioned, though, that you guys, you know, circled back, were able to do some stuff in the final episode. Is, mm. Can you kind of tell me the, a little bit about the work you guys did in that episode? Yeah, there's a handful of things. Quite a few shots, actually. Um, we did, uh, there's a drone shot at the beginning, looking down at a kind of plaza with lots of police in. Um, that was a drone plate that couldn't have people underneath, so we put CG crowds in there. Uh, we created the look of the GRC building for the outside for that, that same shot. Um, and then really the big work was uh, Falcon flying in and smashing the glass and revealing his new Captain Falcon suit um, to the world for the first time. Um, that was a that was a big deal um, and something that we knew everybody would have eyes on and we really needed to make that look good. Uh, there was other work too. There's the the gas clouds, you know, the gas grenades which the um, the flag smashers throw into the conference room and that's all CG smoke. Um, added in there. Uh, and the other work that we had to do was a lot of renders of his shield. Um, so when he's fighting with the shield or throwing the shield, a lot of these shots, or most of these shots are CG shield. And uh, finally, we had to do a costume kind of correction um, where, you know, his new cowl, 
the way the costume's made, it's just very hard for it to be able to stick perfectly to his face as he moves his head around. Um, so sometimes it was kind of coming away from his face and uh, actually a lot of the time it was coming away. And uh, we fixed that by doing a all CG render of him and replacing that whole cow with the CG one. It was the only way to do it. Um, so a lot of the time you see him standing there with his, uh, his cowl and his goggles on. He's all real apart from that piece of costume around his face, which is CG. That's, that's really cool. Now for the, you said that, you know, you guys had to do the new suit. He has a new suit. And, you know, yeah. So he's a captain now. He yeah. comes in the window. Did you get art so you could design that new suit or did, did you guys? No, no. The suit, so the suit is a costume that he's, that Mackie's wearing. Okay. So, so the suit had been designed. Um, already it's just you know in in those shots he would be uh he would stand up in the plate um or kind of roll and stand up um in his suit and it was pretty well lit you know had this big dramatic side light that catches the reflection on his shield and kind of glows it looks all super cool um and we had to do the the handover you know we see him flying outside it's pretty small right we see him flying across new york we had to create that um that whole cg uh, New York out there um, for those shots and he he flies towards the window and then he he chucks his shield through smashes a hole in the glass and you still can't quite see what's coming can you looking through the broken window to him you know it's not that clear um, and then you get that that wide of him catching the shields it no it's when he throws it isn't it you see it you see him throw it you still haven't seen a really great look at it you know what's coming he smashes through the glass and rolls and stands up and uh, you get that hero moment when the camera goes in close to him and you, and you kind of realise, you know, that's him in his new costume. Um, that was, it was such a cool shot, such a cool moment. Yeah, it was, a, it was one of the best parts of the series, not only the final episode. Yeah. Um, so then I know you've won a lot of awards, you know, I, right before I wrap up, you've won a lot of, you've won awards, you've been nominated for a lot of awards for what you do. You've worked on dozens of, of films was there anything in this that you felt like was the first time that you had to tackle something like this and, and kind of felt like you did something new, um, taking on the Falcon and Winter Soldier that felt like it was a little bit different than the rest of the stuff that you've done prior to this? Yeah, I think um, the thing that was most different was the, uh, the episodic TV thing. And also this being new for Marvel, um, worked on a bit of, uh, did some Game of Thrones and that's, you know, episodes. Um, but doing this for Marvel, this did feel new and different. Um, it was a different process. Um, I actually really enjoyed it. Something I've wanted to do for a long time, um, you know, more episodic TV stuff. And I, I think it worked really well. It worked for our team, it worked for the company. I think we all enjoyed it. Technically, no, not so much. I mean, we, you know, this, I don't think there was anything we did that we really struggled with or didn't know how to do. You know, we weren't trying to work out something new, really. Um, the, really, the, what was new was how to get this done on time, lower budget than than we're used to. Um, and we had, you know, it, that couldn't it couldn't look like that. Obviously, this is it's Marvel's first venture into this kind of work, and it needs to look damn good. We, we didn't want anybody to think it looked anything less than what we've done for their films. Um, so that was our challenge. That was the big challenge, really. Awesome. And before I wrap, um, to let you, before I let you go, is there anything else that we didn't touch on that you want to mention or anything else that you'd like to plug? Um, I, I would like to plug the fans of the show and some of the people that we've seen on YouTube making their kind of fan reaction videos, um, they were really important to us. We, we, uh, we looked at, um, at some of these reaction videos. From, These people are mega fans. They know, you know they <laughs> this stuff and they know the material so well. And they know, you know, they have high expectations and they understand all the characters. And um, when we see them really kind of getting it, what we were trying to do they you know they they pick up on all the nuance and the, the 
the ideas that we were going for, and it's, it really does mean an awful lot. It's, it's good. If we know that they like it, um, we know we've done well. I remember this when we were doing um, Lord of the Rings before even the first one had been finished. This is going back away. Uh, we all knew we were making it for the fans. This was, you know, a very widely read book. There were a lot of fans out there. We knew it had to be, we had to do right by them. And there was a sense of that on this, on this job that, you know, there are fans out there who are waiting for this and it has to be good. And it can't be um, low budget. It can't be disappointing. And also we knew we had the, the first, the uh, first 10 minutes of the first thing going out, you know, it was super important. We were originally going to go out uh, before One Division, so it was going to be the first thing anybody had seen that Marvel were doing like this. Um, so yeah, we, we did it for the fans really. It was very gratifying seeing how much they liked the work and understood what we were trying to say. Literary Joe's Inner Child Podcast.